by the way, app caller in the last hour, I, you know, I said I've, I was just uh, speaking off the top of my head. I, I said I'm guessing that 90 percent of the vaccine hesitancy out there is being driven by right wing media. And this guy called and said, "Do you have any evidence of that?" Uh, during the break, uh, Nate in fact found it. The Axo, Axios Ipsos tracking poll that found that uh, of people who use MSNBC or CNN as their principal source of news, 83% are vaccinated. Whereas people who use Fox News as their principal news source, it's 62% of adults who are vaccinated. So that's a 21% uh, spread, which is pretty substantial. So let's do a deep dive into all this stuff with, uh, with our old buddy, Dr. Eric Feigelding, the epidemiologist and health economist. He's a senior adjunct senior fellow with the Federation of American Scientists formerly a faculty member and researcher at the Harvard Medical School and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, his website is fas.org. Oh, that's, that's fas.org. His, his, uh, the principal way to follow Dr. Feigelding, or at least how I do, is on Twitter. Uh, Dr. Eric Ding, E-R-I-C-D-I-N-G is his Twitter handle. D-R-E-R-I-C-D-I-N-G is his Twitter handle. Or FAS Scientists for the, for the Federation of American Scientists. Dr. Feigelding, welcome back. Uh, you know, before we dig into things, uh, uh, can you give us a kind of an overview of exactly where we're at? I, there's been speculation here in Oregon from the Oregon health officials that we have passed the last great wave and that probably by the end of the year, December 26th actually was the date that they put their finger on, uh, that, that this state would have hit herd immunity between vaccinations and infections. Um, what say you about that, and what's the national scenario? I think we're overly optimistic because although cases are dropping, um, I want to re remind people that uh, during a drop, ha half as many, uh, twice as many people are going to die um, over the whole course of the wave, and only half of them um, die in the build up to the wave, um, first of all. And second of all, we're, we're going to have another wave. In certain ways, respiratory viruses like flu actually are worse in the winter months and lowest in August and September. Yet we had, in August and September, already a really, really bad surge. A and flu? So winter is coming still, and so we're still going to have another wave because we have uh, vaccines are waning, boosters are not being rolled out yet, kids are not vaccinated yet, um, and altogether, you know, it puts together a perfect, a perfect storm. And as you mentioned earlier, a lot of people are not vaccinating among Fox uh, News viewers and other people in the South. And that's really frustrating because those people are in certain ways, if you think about it, they're not mixing with the vaccinated people. They're oftentimes in their own little bubbles and still super spreading it in their bubbles. So we're not out of the woods. And I think the worst is still potentially yet to come with one more wave during the winter. Yikes. So uh, what's the latest on everybody getting the booster? I'm over 65, so I, I got my booster last week. In fact, a week ago today. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I work with people who aren't over 65. We're all vaccinated more or less around the same time, you know, uh, spring of last year. Um, and uh, they can't get boosters. What's the deal? Well, first of all, I, you actually can get boosters if you're under 65, if you work in a high-risk occupational setting. Um, or if you're high risk yourself. So high exposure settings, such as teachers. And, and in many ways, you know, your doctor, is that your doctor's discretion whether you can get it oh, um, based on your occupational. So you can, but it's very confusing. And I think in many countries, uh, Israel is giving it, uh, basically, you're not fully vaxxed until you're triple vaxxed for everyone over the age of 18. Right. And I think that's honestly a better approach. Look, you, uh, the transmission is still the problem because waning nuts doesn't, it's not like a, a cliff that you hit six months and all of a sudden the waning starts. The waning already starts around month three and it progressively gets worse by month four and five and six. It's just where we arbitrarily saying, oh, month six, we should get boosters. But, you know, the transmission risk is still there. And, you know, if there's two viruses, more transmissible, less deadly, um, or more deadly, less transmissible, it's the more transmissible, less deadly that will actually kill more people in the end. It's the transmission that's the danger. Simply because uh, it infects so more that, people. The sad thing is Delta is both. It's more transmissible and it's more deadly. Right, simply because it's infecting more people. No, for two reasons. It, it is if infected, you have a higher chance of hospitalized and dying. Oh, with Delta, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, with I, Delta. Yeah, and, yeah. But it's also uh, more incredibly more transmissible. And that together 
uh, creates a, a really, really bad combination because, you know, the herd immunity, we first, we people have been saying we're herd, we're herd since last May or June. Mm-hmm. Everyone's been saying that uh, among the a lot of the downplaying COVID dismissal. Us epidemiologists, we've been saying, no, the herd immunity is not there because in many ways, first of all, not enough people have been infected previously and not people enough people have been immunized. Like Israel is like 85, 90 percent immunized with triple vax and it, they're still not a full, a full herd. In many ways, you have to think about this, that, um, you know, herd immunity theoretically is in a dance floor, you're dancing together uh, and 70, 80 percent of the people are immunized. Well, Delta, you need 90 percent. But we're not mixing together. The, the vaccinated people are in their cluster and unvaccinated people in their cluster. And oftentimes the virus will keep spreading in these other people. So the herd immunity approach is not really working when half of our society is so splintered and segregated from each other. Yeah. Now, uh, there was a piece that was published in a journal that is owned by the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, it was just, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, suggesting that as many as half, this was a study of, as I recall, uh, several hundred thousand people. I'm sorry, I don't have it printed out in front of me, um, but uh, a, a substantial study um, that looked at people who uh, were not necessarily even hospitalized and, and in many cases had very mild cases of covid and yet about half of them were still experiencing symptoms, you know, months after they, uh, quote, recovered. And those symptoms included things like dementia, uh, exhaust, continuous exhaustion and, uh, you know, and, and decrease in, in heart and kidney function, among other things. Um, how, how extensive is the disability associated with having had COVID? I mean, we've got roughly 50 million yeah. Americans who have had COVID now. How many of those people are disabled? Does that have anything to do with why employers can't find employees right now? I mean, do we have people who are out of the workforce because, you know, they, they, they just walking out to the car gets them out of breath? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I, I want to point out that long COVID is still being studied, but it's clinically recognized. We have ICD diagnosis code for them. And it varies in people, but it is a substantial number of people. We're talking at least 15% of everyone infected. Uh, and that is a very large number. So if you talk about, you're talking about kidney damage, you're talking about heart damage, you're talking about lung scarring, you're talking about neurological damage. You know, in one study in the UK of 80,000 people, 13,000 of which were infected, they actually found that if you're hospitalized and intubated you and survive, assuming you survive, you lose about seven points of IQ equivalent. If you're hospitalized, not intubated, you're still losing about three or four points. But even if you're not hospitalized, even with very mild symptoms, you're still losing one to three points of IQ. And I just want to put that in perspective. No one accepts lead poisoning as okay in our society, but yet lead poisoning causes two points. Lead poisoning is two points of IQ damage, and we don't allow two points of IQ damage. If we don't allow that, I don't know why we're allowing so much, um, you know, long COVID neurological damage uh, for millions and millions of people. And to say that, oh, it's okay, or, you know, kids are low risk. Because in a certain ways, kids have 70, 80 years of healthy life ahead of them. And you should not compare that, oh, kids, are hospitalized or died less than an elderly person who are vaccinated. No, that is the wrong comparison. Kids should not be dying, period. Every single death that we have, every single uh, hospitalization and kid whose IQ is permanently damaged potentially for the rest of their life is a tragedy, and we cannot allow that to happen. So long COVID is incredibly kind of dangerous. Our costs are disease burden, hospitalization, medical bills, but also the long-term impact to our society is just really, really scary. Yeah, and and we don't know yet if this is impar- impacting our labor markets. Apparently, um, I, the, my last question uh, is about mutations. Are 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 there any on the horizon that should concern us? Well, there's also the mu variant. So the mu variant uh, still seems to be losing out against the delta variant. Delta variant is still the king. Um, the mu variant in certain countries is holding on steadily. In Ecuador, um, it's, it seems to be, you know, neck and neck with Delta. In other countries, Delta is still by far much more infectious. 
Um, we'll have to see. But the problem is the more we infect, the more uh, it, there's greater chance that the new strain will emerge. Right. Um, and, you know, basically it's a matter of warm bodies. If we keep giving the virus more warm bodies to infect, it will, it's kind of, it treats it like a playground. It will then learn how to adapt. And eventually, you know, it's like, think of the Borg, uh, you know, yeah. in, in Star Trek. They will eventually adapt, and then we're really in trouble. Yeah, we so do. I hope we don't have to have another class of boosters for the new variants. And this is why now stopping it now is so urgent. Yeah. Uh, we just have a minute left and, and, until a hard break. Um, it, uh, the, the, the worldwide, I mean, we've got to get this under control worldwide if we're concerned about mutations. Yeah. What's being done there? Worldwide, the problem is we're not vaccinating uh, low-income countries enough. Like, low-middle-income countries are now kind of getting it. But low-income countries, only a tiny fraction, like less than 10% of low-income countries are vaccinated. And the problem is, you know, a lot. some pharma company like Moderna does not want to sell to low-income countries. And the COVAX is not getting enough donations. And so we're kind of really in this rock and a hard place where there's still lots of mass infections in a lot of these other countries. And eventually we're going to get unlucky. And I fear like, uh, you know, we can try to get it under control in the U.S. eventually after this winter, a wave is over. Mm -hmm. But I think we're still going to play, be playing whack-a-mole um, for, for another year or two until we vaccinate the world. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget the, the, the so-called Delta variant didn't start here. It started in India, as I recall. Right. Yeah, so uh, here we go. <laughs> Off to the races, right?